Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the Alberta Canola Producers Commission. Joining us on the line today is Murray Hartman, the Provincial Oil Seed Specialist for Alberta Agriculture and Rural Development, and Murray's going to run through the biology of canola flowering and the effect on heat. So I'm just going to turn it over to Murray at this time. All right, I think I'm now in control, so Rick is going to be just watching from here on in. And we can see yeah. your screen, Murray. Okay, everybody can see my screen fine. So, yes, um, I've given this presentation a couple times, and given this time of year, it's, it seemed like it was a very timely presentation on coral flowering, and actually we're expecting some some heat later this week, and I'll, just, I'll, um, I'll talk about some of the symptoms you will see and what actually is happening in the biology of, of the plant, of the flower. So, you know, um, hopefully everybody can see my cursor. It's a larger arrow there. You know, when we talk about the canola flower, actually, you know, there's both male and female parts. So the, the center part is the pistil, which is the female part, and it has the style, and at the very top it has a, you know, a, a, a stigma, it's called, that actually receives the pollen. There's six um, male parts, they're stamens. Um, there's four long ones and two short ones, and they comprise a filament. And then the anther is the lobe end of it that actually has the pollen. And a lot of the, some of the slides I'll be showing are, are kind of cross sections of that, of that lobe. So obviously, you know, when we see canola crops, you know, into the flowering, you know, we see blanks where there's, where there is no pod developing, um, and we see very small pods that have no seeds in them, and, you know, it's always a question, well, how did this happen, what happened? And, you know, sometimes we'll see buds that have turned brown or yellowish and desiccated, and obviously they don't turn into a pod either. So I'll be trying to relate back some of the biology and the weaknesses of, of the flowering to, to different stresses. Um, we do have um, very um, strong um, implications with, with things like hot temperatures on very distorted pods, and I'll be talking about those also later, and as well as these bud blast and sterile pods. So that's what I hope to get to. You know, uh, in cereals, we know that, you know, the, the head starts to form, you know, by the, liter, um, the tillering stage, and in canola, actually, it's about the three or four leaf stage when you can actually microscopically start to see some differentiation of the, of the apex from vegetative to reproductive, and I'll be actually showing some, some high-resolution pictures of that kind of stuff. And with canola, obviously, we know that the the oldest pods, or therefore the, the youngest, the first flowers are at the bottom of the raceme, and as you go up the raceme, the flowers are young, you know, later, later, et cetera, later pods. And also we have branches that come out later. So we know, therefore, that as the buds are being formed, they, they don't form all at once, so they are forming in succession from the first raceme and the first flowers in the raceme, and then later, later flowers, later pods, later branches. So here's some some um, high, um, I guess, optical resolution pictures of, of, you know, microscopically of of a, a leaf primordi or a bud, and initially they just have these leaf primordi and and the apex, but it's all vegetative, and it's not until about the three or four leaf stage that you start being able to say, well, now this is turning into an inflorescence apex and um, we're starting to see some differentiation as you go later on you start to see some actual inflorescence buds start to form and it, it, all that this bud formation kind of takes place in a spiral um, kind of pattern around around the main bud and as you go on you just get more and more inflorescence buds start to get in some flower buds or primordia there and so it's all a kind of a synchronized pattern how it all starts to develop and get more and more buds, et cetera, as you go. So this is all very early, way before bolting stage, so it's important to realize that. You know, and then as you, you know, so we'll peel, here they're peeled off one of the, the flower primordia bud, and you're starting to see all the different flower structures, some long stamens, short stamens, and, and the pistil in, in the middle starting to form, and it just advances as you get as you get later here, we're probably still well before the green bud stage, um, and but we are starting to see actual physical structures of, of the stamen starting to elongate a little bit, 
As you, as you go over on this side, slide, you can see that now we're starting to see the anthers develop. Interesting, at the bottom of the anthers, you see the nectaries, which is what the, the bees actually go after. So that's kind of a, a picture of how the buds are actually forming before we ever see them, and it's kind of, kind of interesting. So when, when we talk about pollination, you know, obviously it's, you know, the, the pollen movement from the male and landing on the female and then going down and actually fertilizing the seeds. It's important to remember that every seed is pollinated by one pollen grain. They're not, one pollen doesn't fertilize all the seeds in the pot, so actually every seed in the pot is different, you know. And so I'll be talking about, you know, the, the, the male pollen um, formation as well as the, the female development. When you look at the female, the, the egg, it's on this, the egg cell is actually a very small co um, component of the whole um, embryo sac, and I'll be talking a little bit about the synergies and the, and the polynuclear in, in the center of it, because fertilization process is more than just fertilizing the egg. So when we talk about the anthers developing, you know, we, we, we start to see them, you know, they call them microsporangium, but you start to see early on in the anther development, they, they'll get these small microspores and they develop, they actually, they're called tetrads because they have two um, nuclei, sperm nuclei in addition to a vegetative um, nuclei, so that's why they kind of get to be called a tetrad. And as, as they mature, it's actually this this layer inside the, the anthem, the anther that deposits a coating on top of the pollen grain. And that um, coating is important to keep it from being desiccated when it's released, etc. But it's also very important for pollen recognition. You know, with, with Brassica wrapper, Polish canola, it's, it's an obligate cross-pollinator. In other words, if pollen from this um, same flower lands on the same stigma, it won't pollen, pollinate because that plant knows hey, it's it's my own pollen, I don't want that. And it's that coating is that actually is sending the signal to the plant. Now with Brassica napis or Argentine, it's it can self pollinate so and it, so it doesn't have that pollen recognition recognition um, impediment that Brassica rap has. It's also interesting that 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 layer that what's called the tapetum and that that puts on all that coating, that's actually the layer that um, the male sterility system in, 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 in bigger varieties that has been targeted and that's how it, it achieves its male sterility. So as you know, as that has all happened and you've got that coating and they've matured, then then the anthers will first open their lobes and, and release their, their, their pollen. And this is all a very, of course, orchestrated um, process with, with the right hormones that's needed and balanced for this, you know, for, for the filaments to elongate and all that kind of thing. Just how much pollen? It's about 25,000 to 100,000 pollen grains per flower and released gradually over several, several days. So there's a lot of pollen produced by canola flowers and people with allergies can, can attest to that. There's more um, released in warmer, drier weather. They also, uh, from these diagrams, it looks like they're, they're just is single, but actually they're released more in clumps of, of two, three, and four. And the mature pollen is actually somewhat semi-desiccated, so it's a little bit more resilient to environmental stress, but it also means it has to be hydrated once it, it, it's received by the female parts. So these are some graphs when people actually in England um, with, with spring sown Argentine canola measuring the amount of, of pollen grains that's landing on the stigma over over time. And so you can see initially, you know, there's roughly 500 to, you know, perhaps as much as 1,000 um, received on the stigma and then that just goes up within the first four hours. We're talking several thousand pollen grains landing on that stigma. and and. On conversely, you see that the number of pollen grains that are being left in the anthers is going down as over time because it's releasing it. So you see that initially, the, the, this example roughly is about 60,000 um, pollen grains in that anther, and it's released within five hours to you know probably about half that. So, so there's lots and lots of pollen, and about half of the ovules are actually fertilized in the first hour after flowers are open. So initially, 
probably the the ovules are are the are the limiting factor, you know. Uh, but then it's the pollen grains are just overwhelming them, the number of ovules that are there. Um, Initially, the Baraska family, they were really structured for insect pollination because they have very bright petals. They also have UV guides on their petals, as these pictures down here, the darker colors and the UV light are actually UV guides for the bees. And they also have nectaries. So that all means that these flowers were designed for, for insect pollination. And that's probably very much true for a lot of the self-pollinated kind of Baraska species. But Baraska napis or Argentine is capable of self-fertilization and therefore the insect pollinator need is a lot less. And But when you look at studies on, on beehives and, and canola yield and Argentine canola, it's got varied results ranging from no effect to perhaps 50 percent higher yield. So it's not really clear just how much insect pollination is required for, for, for Argentine canola. In the UK, they did a study that uh, bees only contributed about 1 percent of the pollen that landed on a canola uh, stigma. So I think in, under certain circumstances when pollination isn't, isn't happening very well that the bees could, could certainly very well help. But I think under our field conditions um, it, it, it's a process that happens quite, quite readily without, without bees. So the, so the real, I guess the drama or the real wonder of, of, of pollination is that, you know, the pollen grain lands on the top of that you know, female part to stick in. There's a bunch of these little fingers sticking up, and then it's got to recognize that this is the right pollen grain. And if it does, if it is, then the the actual female part of the plant will give a signal to that pollen grain that it can germinate and give some nutrients, etc. So it will hydrate and start sending the pollen tube down. And then it guides that pollen tube down to grow down the style, and then eventually to the, to the, the ovaries or the or the seeds. So it's a very, you know, guided process. It's very interesting. Um, so initially, when that pollen grain lands and it gets the right signal, and it does germinate. It starts to send this pollen tube down, and it carries the two sperm cells along in in the tip as it's going down. And eventually, it has to find its way down to the to the ovule, or the, and then it often shifts direction, goes down the little stalk that's holding the, the little seed finds the opening, there's a tiny opening in there, and it gets in and then these two synergies on the other side of the egg kind of um, synchronize the release then of the two sperm cells. One fertilizes the egg and the other fertilizes the, the, the central or the polar nuclear that forms the endosperm or the starch that, that the, the seed kind of can lives on for a while. So it's a double fertilization that happens there. So hey, Murray. Um, yep. I'm just going to bring up a couple of questions that have come in okay. from Jason that are timely. Is there yep. anything that can happen to the pollen to make it sterile or to the stigma so that it won't receive the pollen? Yes. Um, um, well, it's probably not so much the stigma that is um, susceptible. It's probably the, the ovules or the eggs down there in, in that case that can be injured. Um, by environmental stress or perhaps nutrients, but there's also, as I'll talk about later, that there's a, a certain percent that are, aren't are defective right from the from the get go, so they won't be fertilized. Um, but that process, you know, of that of that pollen tube growing, and I'll show you some pictures. It's it's also the fastest growing structure in a plant, relatively. That that pollen tube will grow that distance in a, in a matter of you know minutes to an hour, and that's quite a long distance relatively. So if you have environmental conditions that aren't good for fast growth, you know, very hot and dry, then those pollen tubes won't be able to grow, you know, down long, fast enough before dehydrating, et cetera, and, and, and the fertilization won't happen. But it's, once that pollen grain is semi-mature, it's, it's fairly resilient until it starts to germinate. And so th those would be the environmental conditions that would be affecting that process. So here's, here's an, uh, this is a, with Arabidopsis, which is a very close relative to canola, and it's a good model plant. And here's electron microscope of a pollen grain. And you can see the netted structure, all those, you know, reticulation and holes in it. That's, that's a pattern that the waxes and stuff on these fingers of the stigma have to recognize and to get, you know, the right signal. And then it allows, if it is the right pollen grain, it will allow this pollen tube to start growing. 
And so in this colored picture, you'll see all those little things are actually pollen grains that have germinated and sent their pollen tubes down in, into the egg. So you can see there's lots that lands on a stigma. In fact, you know, we find that um, it's probably a minimum of about 150, 160 pollen grains that have to land on an Argentine canola stigma that would um, have enough potential to fertilize all, all the possible seeds in a pot. Another high um, kind of resolution picture of a pollen grain landing on a, the finger of a, of a papilla of a stigma and then within 45 minutes it's, it's, the recognition has happened, You're starting to see some pollen tube germinating, that's the force of it, pushes the pollen grain off of it and then it will, within an hour and a half it's already grown down the length of that, of that stigma little finger. So it's a process that happens very quickly. So here's a, an electron microscope um, picture of in Arabidopsis of how it's kind of a little bit harder to see, you know, but this gray area is, is the pollen tube growing down that, that stalk that holds the seed and then sensing that there is a viable seed or, or a viable ovule in there switches direction all of a sudden. It's been guided all the way to here and then all of a sudden the eggs and perhaps the synergies are sending out a signal that uh, here's the door over here, so it makes an abrupt change, goes through the door of the micro opening, and then and then fertilizes the egg and the, and the central nuclear. So it's all a very guided process. Interesting enough that if that has already been fertilized, that pollen tuber won't even grow down that little stalk. It'll carry on and, and go right by. Or if there's something wrong with the ovule, um, that pollen tube will be growing down that stalk and it should get a signal to come in there, but it's got not getting any signal because it's probably a defective ovule, and it'll grow right on by. In fact, about 20 to 30 percent of the ovules aren't fertilized, even under optimal conditions. And and some studies have found measured that there's actually a lot of defective um, um, embryos that they don't have a whole all the constituents and or they lack the embryo sac completely. So it's the canola isn't perfect in setting all their ovules up to the start, but they certainly have a lot of a lot of extra capacity, so that's probably how it compensates for that. Usually whether it's a complete ovule or not is determined about a, one week before the actual flower opens. So once all that the amazing fertilization happens, um, then the pods immediately within a couple days start to elongate and that will carry on for probably about a week, but they also increase in, in their width or their girth. And it's interesting, if you don't get all the seeds um, fertilized in that, um, in that pod, where there's missing the seeds, there's not a hormone signal for the pod to increase in the width at that spot. So sometimes you'll see those restrictions on the pods and that's just natural because it's, it's sending out a signal that we don't need all that uh, girth at, at this point. The fertilizing seeds, so they're sending out these hormones and that stimulates the pod growth, but it also speeds death of the flower parts because they're no longer needed. We've already got, you know, um, fertilization, we've got, you know, seeds growing, etc. And it also has a cumulative effect as you get more and more fertilized ovules, they start to suppress the later flowers and even on, on branches. So that's why, why when you think back to the original, you know, of the original slides of the canola racine with all the pods, you get smaller and smaller pods and less and less seeds as you go up, and that's because as you've had successful seed set, it's going to suppress this hormone sequence are going to suppress the success of later flowers to the event to the point where it just isn't going to happen. Now, if you get some kind of stress conditions where you don't have you know, good um, flower fertilization and pod set for the first half of the racine, and then all of a sudden conditions change, you will notice great big pods again, and that's because they haven't been suppressed because there's been a lack of, of fertilized, you know, um, flowers and pods before that. So after, you know, the, the flowers have been fertilized and pods that the growth seeds can still abort, you know, four to, you know, eight, roughly eight days after flowering, and there's a kind of hierarchy, a, a pecking order, and that the more, more immature ovules are the first ones that get pushed out of the kind of the nest. And they're often the ones that are furthest down the pistol. So obviously this, the, the 
pollen tubes had to grow the farthest to get to them, but they, they, those tend to be the most immature ovules also. So sometimes you'll see, you know, blanks in the very bottom of a pod, and that just shows you that they were the most immature ovules. And obviously the ovules that are in later flowers, such as at the terminal end of racine, are also the most immature and most apt to be aborted. So there is a hierarchy or pecking order in canola flowers. So when we talk about stress, we're, we're saying when are the canola flowers most vulnerable? And in summary, it's from the green bud or the bolting stage, you know, right before it starts to bolt actually, to one week after flower opening. And I'll be showing some research that actually um, supports that. Canola though has a a great overproduction of flowers that will allow it to overcome defects and, and stress losses. And only about half the flowers in canola will set pods and seeds. So we have almost double capacity in canola. So that's why it can compensate so well for poor early conditions with, with more branches and, and, and late flowers. So we're moving on now to what happens or what the canola flowers you know, look like when they start getting under heat stress. It's specific. So this is some research that was done some over 20 years ago when they took Westar Argentine canola and they put it in 30 degrees temperatures during the day and 26 at night versus normal was, was 23 and 18. And right away when the flowers had come out, all of a sudden the pistil was coming out way too early. There was no petals you know, being opened or anything. So that's a sign of, of stress when you start to see these pistils emerging before the bud actually opens. And then when you peel back, you know, the petals that did emerge, you'll see that the stamens um, were very, very short. And actually they were probably were quite discolored. And so we peeled all that away. You could see just how short the stamens actually were beside this pistil, a sign of, of, of heat stress. And when they cut this anther, in cross section, he looked at here's a normal one under that temperature. You could see the pollen grains normally inside that anther lobe right before it would be released. Here is the one that was under heat stress. So quite a poor spongy structure, but very very few pollen grains inside. Also, they they documented this you know 25 years ago that that when you had that heat stress, you started to have these distorted pods, you know, very fat, bloated pods, and when you opened them up, the seeds were all very abnormal. In fact, there's even some structures in there that looked like another pistol growing, you know, inside the pod. So actually, you know, the, the hormones, you know, were way upset by the stress and just the plant was, had gone quite into a mutated state, and that you do see that. So here's a, actually a color photograph of, of uh, stressed buds where you can see these pistils are emerging through these buds, but the flower hasn't opened yet, which is, again, a sign that there is, there's something wrong, and, and it could be heat stress. This is a picture from the manual where um, it was ascribed to both heat, drought, and wind. So, you know, these buds aren't, aren't healthy at all and they're desiccating and that's again, you know, so we've got a combination of stresses. Whether the pistol would have emerged earlier or not, it's hard to say, but certainly these buds are, have, been, have been blasted probably by the combination of heat and wind. And that's something though a lot of these studies, when they did in, the, in growth chambers and they would have temperature, but they still would have a fairly decent humidity. So it may not always reflect what you see in the field. So, um, this is a picture actually of a male sterile flower. Um, so you see the buds all, all look fairly normal. If, if you looked really, really closely, I, I guess you might think they might be a little more narrow than normal because the anthers don't develop. But yes, with, with male sterility, it hits the anthers and shortens shorten them to about a third of the normal length and there's no viable pollen inside. So how would you tell this is not a heat stress? Well, for one thing, the pistol didn't come out early, the flower petals seem to be the nice same size, and if you looked at all the flowers on this plant and all the flowers on later branches of this plant, they would all be male sterile. And then, you know, um, for example, if this was a volunteer from, you know, from previous crops and the segregation, you could have male steriles, while the neighboring plants that, we, that you seeded should show normal flowers. So that's how you might be able to pick out a male sterile plant out in the field versus something that might be heat stressed. So here's a, a rather busy slide, but it comes from an experiment that was done you know, almost 10 years ago. And what he did this, is he took 
in about a, after almost a week of flowering, you give it a, a week or two weeks of heat stress, and that was 35 degrees ramped up um, for for four hours, but ramped up from 23 degrees, and 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 then 18 degrees at, at night, and he carried that on, and he looked and he allowed the plant to then rebranch, et cetera, and that after you know um, the the heat stress was removed, so the the first slide top of the graph is the number total number of flowers and and the and the triangles is, are actually the the control plants that were just kept at the cooler temperatures so you see as they hit hit their heat treatment um, it did affect the number of flowers because that had already been set beforehand um, so you know it doesn't make the flowers magically disappear so they would have opened but maybe not been successful but after the heat stress was removed you know about a week all of a sudden there was a lot more flowers even relative you know than the control and that's a sign of compensatory um, late flowering because it knew the plant would know by then that a that these earlier flowers weren't successful so now we can set more and when you look at the number of pods here's the control and it, it ends up with about 50 percent pod set and here's um, the square is squares filled in squares are one week heat treatment and you'll notice that the number of pods, here's where the heat treatment started, but the number of pods in these heat treatments were less than the control, even going backwards three or four days. So actually, obviously it did affect you know, flowers that perhaps were three or four days old. And then as you remove the heat stress, all of a sudden you start to see this bump about a week later of, of pods being set. So you know, it, the heat hurt pods that had already just been formed, the so flowers, set, but then it carried on an effect for about a week after that stress was relieved. Then, of course, then the number of seeds that were in those pods is the same kind of um, symptom as that. Here's where the stress happened, and you'll see that there's less seeds per pod relative to control for about three or four days before, and then there wasn't the recovery in the seeds per pod until about a week after that, that stress had been relieved. And very similar thing for, 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 for the seed weight that the recovery takes takes a while for you know for the stress to be relieved before recovery can happen. What, another interesting study said, well, which one is more sensitive? Is it pollen or is or is it the female parts? And this was an interesting study. So they had two groups of plants, three groups of plants. One where they have um, the plant just in a normal growth chamber, cool temperatures, and then they have one where it's hot, and they take the pollen from that hot plant, and then they and then they pollinate plants in the cold cold plants. Or they have another set where they have hot plants, and they'll take cold pollen and put it on the hot stigmas or the hot female parts, and or they'll take both hot pollen and hot stigmas, and see what happens. So, and it wasn't an, if they had both hot pollen and hot piss. Um, you know, female parts, they didn't really get any pollen germination. So the ratio of the number of pollen tubes to the number of eggs, it was, you know, in that basically almost, you know, one to three, one to four ratio. But when you took hot pollen and put them on cold female parts, your ratio really went down. It went from 35 to, you know, that ratio was a lot narrow here, 9 and 123, but when you put, took cold pollen and put them on a hot pistol, that ratio still was pretty decent. When you put hot pollen on a hot pistol, stressed, there was very few pollen tubes actually appear ovules, and that shows up then in the number of aborted pistols, the number of these parthenocarpic pods where they're growing, but there's really not any seeds inside, the number of seeds that are in the pods are greatly reduced. So. It, you can see that actually both female and male parts are are affected by quite a bit by by the heat stress. They also found that just the plants themselves in in the hot treatment they were relatively sterile, so they said there might even be some mechanism that the the um, self pollination potential of canola is is affected. Um, or the pollen recognition system is affected at very high temperatures because if they took hot pollen and change it to another hot stress plant, they still could get some, some um, seeds in some pots. 
so here's some pictures of, of, of those kind of crosses. So this is cold pollen on a, you know, on a cold pistol and kind of normal pods. To caught pollen on a cold pistol, you start to see, you know, obviously not much seeds in that pod, um, a few normal pods, and then these aborted pistols. Um, and they would generally just fall off and you'd see those, those blanks. And, and here's where he took the cold pollen onto the hot pistol. So we still had some aborted pistols. We still had some, you know, poor pods. And then when, of course, it was hot pollen on hot pistols, that, that was very much the worst case where you had these small sterile pods, just the odd pod with some seeds in it and, and some aborted. So they, they call these parthenocarpet because the actual fruiting body continues to grow, but there's no seeds in it. You know, kind of like a waterless, um, you know, watermelon that, you know, somehow the plant is fooled into thinking that, yeah, I can grow a pod because, you know, there's going to be seeds in there and there really isn't. And so here's a, a picture of these sterile or parthenocarpet carpet pods. So they've actually started to elongate you know, starting that fruit event, but there's no, no seeds inside. Um, th there's a, another study by a researcher in Saskatchewan who took, you know, and, and you know, into mid-flowering and then he hit it with different heat stresses. I think it was 35 versus 28 versus the control of 15 for a week, and then he stopped it. And this is just a picture of a racine where he started this heat treatment. This was a high heat treatment at 35, and you can notice that the lower pods were affected even before the heat treatment, so it did go backwards a little bit. Then all these during the heat treatment, they're all, they're all sterile um, parthenocarpic pods. And then after the heat treatment was ended, the next week or so, we had all these distorted pods happening. Um, so this is, these aren't um, being developed under hot conditions. You know, the flowers might have been there. So obviously there's something that really severely disrupts the plant's hormones and causes this, this um, you know, very mutated, distorted growth. In this experiment that was done by um, this Morrison in 1993, what he did is he took, he had two different varieties, Westar and Delta, and he had two different chambers, hot chamber, which was, would have been you know, just 27, and then a cold chamber, which was 22 day temperatures. And then at different stages, he would transfer the pots to either hot to cold or cold to hot. I say, well, which is the more sensitive stages? So the C is continuous cold, the H is continuous hot, the V is vegetative stage, B is early bud, late bud, early flower, late flower. And so then he looked at the number of um, pods that were set on the main raceme, the number of seeds per pod, and then the seed weight. So here he's transferring, clear is transferring hot to cold. So, you know, initially, if he tra transferred, you know, um, this, is, this bar is the continuous cold, so he had 50% pod set. If he transferred hot to cold um, at the vegetative, vegetative stage, though, he did still have a reduction. But as you kept, the, you know, um, the later and the later the stages, you know, bud to, you know, flower, it got worse and worse and worse that the longer it stayed in, in the hot, hot, the hot temperatures. Um, conversely, if you're transferring from cold to hot, it doesn't doesn't really matter if you transfer it to cold to hot if it's early in the stages, but it starts to be the later stages that, that it really start to affect the the pod the, the the pod set. Interesting that there was a difference between delta and Westar in the, the effects that you know these two versus this two, and then these two versus these two. So he said there might be some genetic variation how plants respond to heat. So the same kind of trend when you look at the number of seeds per pod as you delay, you know, the, the transfer, it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, the longer it stays under heat stress or the, you know, conversely, the, the, you know, the later that it's transferred from cold to hot. So all this is showing that it was really the, the vegetative didn't have as big an effect certainly as from the bud to the to the flowering stage. There was still some effect in some cases, but it wasn't as dramatic as at the at the bud stage. And what he found is that also um, he was removing also the branches. So he only looked at the main stem, and obviously this didn't allow this plant to recover or compensate anything. And um, both male, male and the female flower flower parts he found were affected. And he also found 60% of these 
parthenocarpic pods or sterile pods in the heat treatment. So all, all this is just evidence that says, yes, you know, the, 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 the stages we really have to be worrying about for the heat stress, and probably a lot of stresses are that, bud stage up, and, and up until uh, flowering. Now, I often get asked, so what is the temperature? And unfortunately, when you look at, you know, here's just a table that's kind of quickly summarizing a lot of this research. There isn't a, a single temperature that you can pick out. Now, obviously, you know, a lot of these done were a fairly good high humidity, so they may not be easily transferable to a, a dry, hot, windy day on the prairies either. But if you look at the, initially um, this experiment, they were comparing fairly cold to 28, and they didn't get any effect at 28, although the statements were slightly shorter. Um, this experiment, they did it up to 30 degrees and um, with heat stress seven days after bolting, and they didn't find an effect. And then they finally these researchers decided, well, we have to go a little bit higher, and they, and they bumped it up to 32 in this experiment, and they got almost complete sterility. So these first few experiments are, well, geez, it looks like we're, we're safe until about 32. But that's, um, you start to get other experiments, and uh, with this Morrison, he, he ramped up his temperatures more slowly, not just a, a continuous or a sudden treatment, and he, from 15 degrees day temperature up to 30, but he started to find some reduced pod and see set between 27 and 30 degrees. So that kind of disagrees with that. Um, this study here in Ottawa, they just did three different seeded dates and then related the you know, temperatures at flowering. Obviously, the later seed was generally hotter. And, and then they just found with that relationship that it was around 29 degrees where it started to affect the flowering. So that was more of a field study. But I don't think it's really fair when you have different seeding dates and think it's just the temperature is the only difference. Morrison in, in, in 93, he had 27 versus 22. And he got almost complete sterility at 27 degrees. These people up here are 28 degrees and none. So obviously there's a lot of variability in how these growth chambers, et cetera, are set and maybe light, um, light um, intensity, all that kind of thing. And, and, and Gaddy, and in this experiment, he had 20 up to 28 and 35. And at 28, he started to suffer some seed loss per pod and yield loss. This, these researchers in, in Australia actually were looking at late um, effects of temperature, late in, you know, so this is 29 days after flowering, they start to have heat temperature. And in this case, they would find that the yield loss would do to reduce seed size. But obviously that's in, in pod, late pod field versus a flowering. Yanti Gan, um, he, his experiments, he found that um, there was a slight yield loss starting at 28 and then sterile pods at 35. So you know, I'm starting to see a picture here that it is probably in that 27 to 30 degrees that we'll, we'll start to see um, some effect on, on, on the plants and the flowers and for the yields. And so young, and those are the, the graphs I showed you later, 23 versus 35, and he certainly did have effects on the yield um, by 35. So in, in summary, you know, the heat stress affects both the male and the female flower parts and the fertilization process. And the best window I can see for starting to assume that there would be some effects is 27 to 30 degrees. And that will affect the flowers that have already been fertilized, and it, but you know, are kind of four or five days old. And they can end up then being aborted, and you end up with sterile or parthenocarpic pods. And then the young pods that have been forming, they and then you hit to hit, have some heat stress, they can start to have some seed abortion up until they're about eight or, you know, a little more than a week old. And then after that, the heat stress, if, it's, if the pot is all of that, it can affect just seed size. Um, it will continue to affect flowers that will open for a week after that heat stress um, period. So sometimes you see those really funny pods, you say, well, that must have just happened. No, it could have been well, at least a week ago that the stress could have happened. But we really don't yet know how many days or how many hours of a heat stress has to happen before there's injury occur, or or yet how the effect of wind. If you have a you know a lot of wind and it's 28 degrees, does that augment, augment the injury, et cetera? We, that kind of stuff hasn't been studied, and all this is acting really through the hormone signals in the plant. Um, it's it's got all these um, 
responses to stresses and it sends up a whole hormone cascade. Um, and it's a way to protect the plant so it doesn't, you know, um, put out a bunch of flowers, et cetera, when its conditions are horrible, but it'll kind of um, kill those flowers and then, you know, save the potential for later on when things improve. So it's kind of natural, but it really does um, um, affect how we view the flowers and, and what's really happening and how long that, that hormone up balance, imbalance actually continues in the plant. Now, obviously, other stresses like drought and something, it also affects the plant through hormones and therefore can have somewhat similar um, symptoms sometimes, but it's generally not as dramatic as temperature. So I hope that that um, helps and give you a bit of background on what you know the biology of the flower actually is 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 doing when during fertilization, how it's kind of got some weaknesses you know, for stress, and then how the hormones actually impact all the the reproductive stages in canola, and and end up showing you some some of the symptoms that we sometimes see. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thanks, Murray. Um, we do have a few questions that have okay. that have come in here. Uh, I'm just going to do my best to read them off and answer them. Anybody who has questions, if you click on that orange button, it may have closed your little control panel in the top right corner. You can open it back up and type a question. Our first question comes from Kent. I'm out here in East Central Saskatchewan. After looking at canola crops around the area, I'm seeing 8 to 10 inch plants flowering and only developing 4 inches of pods. Yeah. What is the likelihood of this crop actually being a harvested crop, and will the short stem support the plant into September? Yeah, and, and, and this is, you know, again, this relates back to hormones. So sometimes people say, well, they're short short because the roots were, you know, um, are saturated, there's no oxygen, so the plant just can't take up nutrients, et cetera, and, and therefore can't, um, you know, produce photosynthesis and have a big, big plant, but there's also hormones have happened and we do know that when the plant gets stressed, it starts to put up a lot of um, um, growth promoting hormones such as ethylene and that speeds the plant to, to reproductive stages because the plant's sensing something's wrong and if I'm going to get any seed, I have to hurry up and get it done, right? So that's why all of a sudden you see these little tiny plants starting to bolt. They say, well, it should have never happened. It probably even skipped maybe a few leaves or the very miniature leaves that were kind of sacrificed their growth to try to get into reproductive stage. When it kind of gets into that high kickstart, um, a lot of times that plant will not recover and, and grow to a normal stature. And so there, there will be, you know, just very small plants with very, very, very little seed set. The odd time, if, if the stress wasn't that long, these small plants, the initial receipt might be small, and then obviously you start to get larger branches as, as the soil dries out gets more aeration and the nutrients in there, it can sometimes recover, but but my opinion, when they've got to that stage where, you know, and they're six inches, eight inches high and they're bolting and there's just very few pods and stuff, those plants are probably never going to amount to much because the hormones have been so so upset in the plant that it's, it's just trying to finish what it has. Okay, question from Terry. Any work on stress mitigation by addition of boron at early flower fungicide timing? Uh, no, I, I'm not aware of anything um, that has been done um, with boron when, when it's under very um, stressed conditions. You know, obviously we know that boron has implication in flowering, um, but if, if it was a boron deficiency that would really help, but if it's all being related to the hormones and how the plant has responded to stress by changing their hormone balance, the boron probably isn't going to help a lot. But there hasn't been really studies that looked at that. Can we help this plant recover a little better by applying some nutrients or perhaps some different growth regulators to say, can we can we kick this out kick start this out of that out of that phase by using hormones? And that might be an avenue to to look at. I think you answered this question in the slide, but it's probably one on a few people's minds because a few yeah. people have asked, what is the temperature above which we start to see an impact of heat on yield? I had seen yeah. Manitoba data that suggests this is about 25 Celsius. Yeah, well, you know, obviously from that slide summary, you know, um, there, wasn't very, there wasn't anything that was down to 25. The lowest where you started to see some effects was at 27, 28 degrees. But these are on the greenhouse conditions, right? Probably fairly decent humidity, and they've been well watered, et cetera. So I would say that 
you know, that's probably a window to say, yeah, 27 to 30 degrees, normally we might start to see some yield reduction, but nothing really severe until probably well after 30. But if you have hot, windy conditions, so it's 25 to 27, but really strong and very dry, low humidity, very dry, I'd say you still could be seeing some effects maybe down to 25 in those cases. So, you know, there's a lot of interaction. And obviously, if it's also, you know, often when it's hot, we also tend to be sometimes dry. And so we could have that implication that the plants, if they're on a little bit of drought stress, um, they're a little bit more vulnerable maybe to the heat. There was one of those studies that tried doing an interaction of, of moisture stress and heat stress, but they didn't really have enough moisture stress. The yield didn't go down at all in the amount of moisture stress they were they were applying, so obviously it wasn't enough, but that, that could be a factor. But I generally say, yeah, that 27 to 30 is where I start with, you know, say we might be suffering a yield loss. Okay, kind of a nice follow-up here from Doug. So cold weather at the 3 to 4 leaf stage, 5 degree nights, 18 degree days, or 12 degree nights and 28 degree days with some moisture stress, would this have an effect on developing flowers, which could later translate into flowers that would not form pods? Uh, my, my, you know, obviously, I think there would be effect, but when, when it's at that early stage, these buds are just forming. And if you get a stress on the plant, it's going to reduce the number that are foreign. So what will happen is you, that when that raceme, first raceme or shoot, does come out, there'd be less flowers on it. Instead of having 30 flowers on that main machine, you might only have 20 or 25. Um, but the success of those flowers is going to be determined more by the conditions at the flowering period. So you might have very good pots and still have 25 pots. So you might see, you know, if there are really stressful conditions early on, you might see a, a kind of a reduction in the number of flowers that first show up. But, you know, it might, it wouldn't have a great effect on you because the plant then, um, it, it senses how many seeds have been fertilized, and it keeps going based on the moisture and the nutrients that are. So, well, you know, that first we're seeing didn't have enough flowers. Our next branches were going to continue to, you know, have less repression of the flowers and produce more pods and, and just keep going. So, it will compensate for that. But I think you could have some effect by early stress, but it won't, wouldn't have a real effect on yield. Okay. Next one comes from John. I see a better tolerance to higher temps with new hybrids versus open pollinated. Heat? Comments? Um, it's certainly a possibility that one study that Morrison did, he was comparing West High and Delta, and he did, you know, find some evidence that there was a difference in response. You know, Delta seemed to be more heat tolerant um, than the West are. And actually that Morrison, I think he's in Ottawa now, he does have an application to start screening some of the germplasm for the heat tolerance. So I think there is some potential to be looking at. I know the Aussies have been looking at that for, for a number of years, but they look at their tolerance is, is, is at different stages, you know. Um, they're looking for cold tolerance during flower and then heat tolerance more at the, at the seed field stage and, you know, at the, and, and the emergent stage. So uh, I think there is some potential that we haven't looked at. Now, would hybrids help that? If there is an effect of, of genetics, then obviously heterosis or the hybrid vicar could actually you know, improve that and, and make a, even a better tolerance to heat. So I think there is some potential question from Marvin. Have you done anything with canopy management with PGR fungicides like the British do and seen what, if any, effects that has on heat stress? Um, no, I, I'm not aware of anything that has, um, from plant growth or, or fungicides and the effect on heat stress. I know a lot of times we'll talk about, you know, um, if the plant is under stress and then we apply it a, a pest control product, whether it's insecticide or fungicide, sometimes just the solvent in there is enough additive stress on the flower buds that it, it creates perhaps more um, flower blasts, etc. But um, for the to change the plant so it has a better ability to recover from the stress, that is something that we haven't looked at. I know in Europe they also play around with plant growth regulators, but they're looking at shortening the crop so it doesn't get so rank and allows more light to penetrate to the pods and help the seed fill, et cetera. But um, they, their windows, um, it's, it's a lot longer for that to happen. There's been a few trials with plant growth regulators and, you know, at, at 
you know, stage to you know shorten crops in Canada, and, and they haven't been very successful. In some cases, they've reduced the yield a fair bit. So, um, not saying that there isn't an opportunity down the road, but we haven't had good success. Our our window is so much shorter than the winter canola that they have in Europe for playing around with those kind of things that I don't think you know we we have as much opportunity as they do. Okay, question from Brian. What effect does heat have on seed quality? In 2005, we had a lot of brown heat damaged seed in harvested field samples. In 2005, we had very hot dry weather at flowering pod stage. Yeah, and and I never got into that in a lot of detail. I mentioned some of the Australian studies um, that found that as you had heat stress, you know, in the potting and, and filling stage, um, that it it affected the seed size, but. There's has been studies in Canada actually um, where the heat stress in that seed filling stage not only reduced seed size but it would lower the the quality of the kernel by lowering the oil content. Usually you have a lower a smaller seed, you have lower oil content, but it also increased uh, free fatty acids, which aren't really desirable. And in some cases, you increase things like brown seed. You know where you, where it's actually that's seed gets desiccated down too quickly and it's not a mature seed. When you ever see a, a brown seed color on canola, you know that wasn't a mature seed and it got, you know, it finished way too early, desiccated way too early. So yeah, there are certainly implications on heat um, later on in, in, in the seed fill stage um, on, on, on the seed quality, but at what temperature that happens, um, I wasn't really able to pick out that there was a vulnerable stage or vulnerable heat you know, um, uh, temperature. I think a lot of it relates back, you know, to wind and things like this also. Okay, another question from Doug. Many fields that are now flowering have bud clusters that have five to six healthy buds and three to four brown buds that are dead, but yeah. show no evidence of bug feeding. What do you yeah. think it could be? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, and this is always the real uh, mystery is that you'll see these these buds. Now, obviously, if they're brown, it's not just that the the it was a, a Im, imperfect ovules, etc. That there was actually something happened to that, and whether it's stress or whether it's bugs, it's sometimes hard to say. Um, when you say bug feeding, yeah, if you're thinking, you know. Um, some of the diamondback moth where they will mine the surface off off of the the you know outer surface of the pods etc of the of the buds that's obvious but there are other um, piercing sucking insects like ligus bug and and even thrips can get in there and do some scavenging inside the bud that you wouldn't really see it physically unless you maybe took it under a, a stereo microscope um, so some of those brown buds may be still due to certain insect damage, but I'm more inclined to think that it's environmental conditions, than, um, and it could be, you know, it might not even be that hot of conditions. If the plant got really acclimatized to cold, you know, which we did have, and then we hit 25 to 27 degree days with some wind, that might be enough to cause some, some bud blasting. But it, you would start to see that on, on many plants where insect damage tends to be in clusters and tend to be in certain parts of the field, et cetera. So uh, there's a few things you can help to, you know, kind of distinguish, but sometimes it's very, very hard. Okay, question from Brian, back to boron. Boron is important in fertilization. Can boron application at bud early flower how mitigate effect of poor pollination? Um, yes, actually, they, they found a few, you know, I'm, 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 fairly boron deficient soil that you can rescue the yield by applying that at, at, at you know, the flowering stage. So it, it certainly can help if that's the reason, but if if it's not, you know, not the reason that there's poor um, flower pollination, it, it may may not have a real influence if you're not going to override, you know, something that's gone wrong with the hormones because of heat, et cetera. But that really hasn't been looked at in my opinion that can we apply some treatments to the plant, whether it might be barm or whether it might be a growth regulator, that we can quickly change this hormone balance to get the plant more productive again. So uh, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but if, you know, I certainly haven't seen any evidence that it could help rescue a, a, a heat stressed um, canola plant. Okay, question from Marvin. We're having a lot of black leg this year. Sorry, I don't know where this is from, but we're having a lot of black leg this year, including some lodging at early bloom. Does black leg, even if not causing severe cankering, cause heat stress to be more? 
Well, um, not likely if it's not causing cankering, because it, you know it it, it only um, really restricts the flow of nutrients once it starts to to canker at the base of the stem. We've had some reports where plants were um, had basal cankers when they were still kind of at the bud to bolting stage, which is really unusual. It happens in countries like Australia where they have severe black lake pressure, but not generally here. So we may have unusual conditions this year that I really allowed the black leg expression earlier, but I haven't seen any of those plant samples myself, so I can't say that for sure. But um, but no, if it's not really cankering the stem, um, it wouldn't be restricting that 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 much and adding that much to the drought stress yet. Okay, question from Karen. Noting a number of fields where main stem flowers have dried right off. Branching buds also struggling, early symptoms due to drought, cold stress, now moving toward heat stress with new branches. How yeah. long will plant continue to try to recover or send new branches and bud? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, <laughs> that's a good question. I think as long as you start, as long as you still see, you know, bud clusters in, in branches, um, it, that plant still has potential. Obviously, the longer it goes, um, the, the later this crop is going to be and, you know, less likely you're going to get it off. But um, as long as you still see those branch buds coming out, that plant is still trying to recover, so it still has some potential. Um, you know, it's, so there isn't, I don't think, any set um, kind of timing. In fact, I've seen a lot of cases where the canola is mature, it's been stressed all year long under drought, and then it's swathed. And then you get some decent rain, and lo and behold, buds start to grow at the bottom of the of the stubble of of, of the canola and start to flower. And that's because, yes, it's all of a sudden the stress is removed. You might get some apical dominance of the, all the seeds that were that removed, and then you had these viable buds buds way down there start to regrow. So it can happen really late in the season. Um, is it productive? No, not then. You know, but. This time of year, maybe the first um, branch wasn't successful, but you know the next you know three branches might be you know so it's still a lot of a lot of potential for, the, for that plant to recover. But obviously, you don't like to see that the later it is in the year because that means we're going to see a September harvest for some of that stuff. So, okay, this might be more of a comment than a question from Jason. But in the piece, we are seeing whole fields with all the buds just stumps on the plants. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I've, I've I've had some discussions with you know people up there already, and it sounds a very you know very weird conditions, and you know I'm trying to rack my brains you know on, on what would do that to whole fields uh, outside of spray issues, you know, with herbicide residues, etc., or just perhaps very late timing of the second applications, and you know at the bud stage and coupled with drought or, or heat stress, maybe causing a lot more desiccation of these buds. Could be insects, you know, could be things like thrips, heavy population of thrips. There's a number of things to start looking at. Maybe there's root disease, and maybe it's, I've heard in some cases really bad brown green and root rot in the piece, and that would be, could be starting to show up as, you know, as effect on, on the buds. Maybe there was a frost, maybe there's a one degree or something of frost, and uh, we did have a very cold night uh, you know, a week or 10 days ago, and, and that might have been enough to, to injure some of these pots, so, um, or the, the flower buds. So it, it, certainly I don't have any answers. I haven't even seen any really a lot of pictures or samples, but there, you know, there's a number of things that could be possibilities. And then with canola, I hate to admit it, but there's many cases where there's just a mystery and never, never really clear what went wrong. Yeah, and Jason just added, uh, what is odd is that there are fields right across the road that are fine. Yeah, so, you know, when there's fields across the road that are fine, you think, well, then, can't be environment, un unless there was a different variety, of high, you know, difference in the tolerance of hybrids, or a slightly different stage, you know, when the heat stress happened, or maybe a little bit different nutrients, or maybe one was on summer fallow versus stubble, you know, that might affect some of the heat tolerance, but it sounds more when you get that kind of situation, it sounds more like, oh, there could be something more related to a management, like the timing of the second application, or was there herbicide residues in the tank, or the residues in the field, or, or something like that. So, you know, I'd be following those lines up um, probably more closely. Okay. Uh, question from Shannon here. 
I have seen short mustard plants in southwest Saskatchewan that are also bolting prematurely at five to six yeah. leaves. It is probably due to excess moisture stress this year. There have been reports of this issue across the province in oil seeds except the Kindersley region. With drier conditions and warmth, can they recover to some degree? Does excess moisture and other stresses cause a response similar to heat stress in oil seeds? Yeah, and uh, you know the the canola has you know kind of a cascade of a stress response where it st where it senses the stress and then it starts to send out these changes the hormone balance in the plant and and the stresses can be different so it could be a heat stress or it could be uh, a, a super saturation flooding stress um, the, the the hormone imbalance may be slightly different the symptoms might be slightly oh. And um, so these plants that are you've been flooded or under saturated moisture, yeah, they do um, change their hormones. They, they're easy, even ethylene being you know, generated from the soil, which is a, pl a plant um, hormone that ca accelerates maturity. Um, now, at what point is it done? Um, I would say that once you got that main raceme and it's you know um, it's kind of flowered and set a few pots, etc., and it, and there's not much coming out of the buds. That that plant is probably not going to not going to recover very well. Um, the other issue is under these saturated conditions is we probably had some nutrient loss of nitrogen and and perhaps leaching of sulfur, et cetera. And at one point, do you think, well, maybe I, it, it could re if it's going to if it's going to recover, I could put some nutrients on it. But you don't know, and so it's really hard to spend any more money on a crop that, in my opinion, is only a maybe that it's going to recover. So in my opinion, I think you have kind of accept your losses on those and. And if they recover, you know, that'd be a nice surprise, but chances are it probably won't. Okay, got a couple more here, Murray. I don't know if you need to get going. We still have no. quite a few people online, so. Okay. Uh, question or comment from Karen, also in the piece, and yes, finding high thrips in field, root maggots, mm -hmm. uh, and same as Jason. Yeah, yeah. so root maggots are something, you start pulling up these roots on these plants that are really bad um, um, bud blasting, and if they got you know, maybe more than three or four um, tunnels on the roots from root maggots, that could be enough to cause you another stress on an already stressed plant um, that would then, and then, but, you know, when you get bud, buds being aborted, they generally don't turn brown on canola plant, um, you know, you'll just get a blank. So when, when they turn brown and being desiccated, I look at that and say, you know, that's, that's probably something either fed on it and, and disrupted the tissue, or there's been enough desiccation event, whether it's a frost event or it's a strong drying heat, hot wind, that causes that kind of a, a browning desiccation on the flower bud. So that's why sometimes I look at these and say, well, it was more than just root maggots, for example. Okay, and Could question. Could be trips, though. Yeah. And a question from Brian. Is hot daytime or evening temperatures more detrimental to seed pollination, seed abortion? Well, yes. Um, I mean, some of those studies that I, I cited, they had different nighttime temperatures, and I was always of the opinion that if you have a warm day, warm to hot day, but you get a cool night, it allows a plant to recover. But um, the the one study that they they looked at, they had a, a 28 and, and 17 night temperature versus the other one had 28 and 23, and the one that had the lower night temperature had the had the worse you know um, effect on the flowers in the, in the yield, but of course they were different experiments, but um, I certainly haven't seen any evidence um, where they've done a trial and say, well, how much does the night temperature allow this plant to recover or not? And, um, but intuitively thinking, you think that the plant could recover a little bit better if it's cool at night. Now, if it's hot during the day, it's, 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 it's poor because this plant is trying to make, you know, make sugar, make photosynthesis, and it has to have its stomata open to take in the carbon dioxide. But if it's hot and under, you know, stress, um, it's going to be losing moisture too quickly and it's going to close those pores. So it's, it's going to affect your yield. Um, and that's why um, it's probably quite detrimental to have really hot temperatures during the day. At night, you would probably just see more respiration losses um, with, with warm temperatures at night. 
Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Marie. That was our last question, and okay. I think I can speak for everybody online that that was absolutely fantastic. We had everybody stay online pretty much till the end for that. So okay. I just want to let everybody know again that uh, we will be doing more of these. There will be a short survey that pops up when you exit this, and we do appreciate it if you could answer the quick four questions there because it helps us move this uh, educational programming forward. Again, everything you need to know is on our website uh, as well as you can watch previews of some of these webinars on our YouTube channel. So once again, on behalf of the Alberta Canola Producers, we thank you for joining us today, and we thank Murray Hartman for his time. We hope everybody has a safe day and a good summer. Bye for now.